celebrating nine years of podcast excellence. The King of Podcasts Radio Network proudly presents The Wrestling Is Real Podcast because wrestling needs us. Welcome to episode 694 of the Wrestling Is Real Podcast. We're going to be doing the post show for AEW's Double or Nothing being held at the T-Mobile Arena, Las Vegas, Nevada. And a hell of a night, exceptional pay-per-view. It was definitely a solid A across the board. We had a number of debuts. AEW does have their method of madness on how they go and deliver matches and what they've decided to do with the show. Now, one thing for sure, with these quarterly pay-per-views, they stacked them. And this this whole pay-per-view took, I want to say it was four hours, 40 minutes. It was a hell of a show to put through. And... I felt like I got more out of it than I did maybe on both nights of WrestleMania with the amount of action that we had and a number of things that happened. But at this point, we already know the the, the matches were very good from top to tail. The storylines and what they decided to go and finish things off with is another story because that's the way you really want to judge on how this show really paid off. Because you get to a B, B plus basically just on the match work alone because the match work was fantastic across the board everybody had good matches on here i didn't feel like anything slowed down one or the other everything felt good this was a hell of a night to watch wrestling it was just you couldn't keep your eyes off of it and i was struggling because i had to go and watch i was trying to watch game seven of the nba easter conference finals because miami heat boston silks are playing and i'm catch, trying to catch that while i'm trying to watch double or nothing it's just kind of a struggle to watch throughout the night but in the matches in themselves when you look at the matches themselves they gave lots of time to everything uh, the tony khan is not afraid to go ahead and just kind of stick to some kind of barrier he had the time on the satellite i guess and just decides you know what we're going to get everything in there and there's a lot of matches they put into it 12 matches on the main car with one buy-in match and everybody got time. Like the shortest match of the night was the TBS title for seven minutes because that's Jade Cargill <laughs> because she's not going to go ahead and work the long matches, especially here anyway. And Warlord MJF was also seven minutes. And that was it. That's all there was to it. Now, with everything else that's going on, you had lots of time for various matches when it came to the Hardys and Young Bucks got 19 minutes. 15 minutes for the trios match with House of Black and Death Triangle. That got a lot of time. Like, there was nobody that got short amount of time. Even the Owen Hart Foundation Tournament invita uh, the Invitational. You basically got about 30 minutes for that right there alone embedded into the show itself. 12 minutes for the men. 13 minutes for the women. The American Top Team, uh, Kazarian... Guevara and Ty Conti match. That got 12 minutes. The Thunder Rose and Serena Deeb AEW Women's World title got 17 minutes. There was a lot of time for all these matches to get what they need to do. Anarchy in the Arena, 22 minutes. 25 minutes for the main event. Like everything really it was just stretched out long. You could have tightened up some of the matches here and there, but they gave you so much. They delivered so much. We had a various number of debuts with Athena, the Fallen Goddess, the former Ember Moon. El Toro Blanco Roosh also debuting tonight. And we got some final finality on certain storylines as well that we didn't get to find out yet because we've gotten a couple things that were really stretched out for a long time that finally paid off. And that was one of the things that was really fascinating is to get to this point. And, and I feel like when we get to the close of certain storylines, we got to it. And it felt good to see it all come culminate where you wanted it to be and that was the best part of all this like there was just a number of you think of the storylines that they had with Wardle mjf going back to almost the beginning of the promotion with mjf and look before i get into the card i haven't talked anything about the mjf situation because it all happened as this show's going on, I know we've talked, I might have even brought it up once or twice, the stories that have been brought up about various contract issues or some disgruntlement by MJF himself, for whatever that might be. And then there was the whole rigmarole this weekend about was he going to be on the show 
wasn't going to be on the show. And then you got to think about the fact that, you know, was he going to take the, he did schedule a flight that was going to go back to New Jersey. If that was the case, back to Newark airport on Saturday night that he knows showed the fan fest that there was a number of things where he wasn't all there. But nevertheless, the first match of the night was MGF and Wardlow, and MGF showed up. Now, regardless of what you think about the outcome here, what I will say is this. MJF has time left on this contract that's been made clear. We don't know for sure what the story is about him looking to go ahead and just continue to just be vocal about the fact that he wants to go ahead and possibly be looked at by WWE because they already know that we already we already know they have a, a look at him right now. And so something could be said that do we want to just say, okay, MJF is going to just kind of hold over the contract and say, you know what, you're paying me this much, but I know that, the, that Vince will pay me this much, and he's going to hold this over their heads as if to get a better deal and to start negotiating early and as often as possible. Because now he feels like he knows his worth. He knows what his contributions have been so far. In terms of himself, getting the rub from Cody Rhodes, getting the rub from CM Punk, and then doing the favors for Wardlow tonight after all that's happened. To me, I think that there's very much down the line where we can see CM Punk go after, or that that unless CM Punk is a new champion, that MJF could very well go after CM Punk for said title. And we know that even with Chris Jericho, M- MJF has been the heel that has been on the other side of mostly losses when it comes to that main closure of a feud. So he's taken the losses. He has done the traditional heel thing. And, you know, there's something more to where, I mean, he knows his, his, his status. And not so much that he's going to get in front of a bigger crowd because tonight was a big crowd for him anyway at T-Mobile Arena anyway, 14, 15,000, okay? Any given time of a pay-per-view for the most part in the WWE, except for the rare times that they're going to move up to a major stadium show, MGF is going to get in front of a bigger audience. And there could be a good chance that Vince and the team there in creative might let MGF get to be who he is and we'll get to actually see him do something. My only thing is, is that I think he'd get a chance to be like how The Miz is in WWE, but will he get the chance to be at that main event status all the time. And that's the point of contention I have if MGF were to leave, that I don't think he would get to stay in that spot. I don't think he has, it's not like he doesn't have the capabilities, but right now he's in the number two promotion in the company, in the country, basically, and there's only one other place he can go to take a step up. And will they give him the kind of expectations that he might have for himself? To be the best wrestler in the world. To be that Ric Flair, you know, Hulk Hogan type level star that everybody is synonymous with wrestling with. That that he's going to be that. He's more than capable of being that star. But for his future, he has to ask himself, AEW has grown while he has grown. We knew his, I knew his potential back in MLW. In the dynasty with Richard Holiday and Alexander Hammerstone. And meanwhile, Hammerstone and Holiday have built themselves up to a, sm- to a nice little point when it comes to the dynasty and the b- b- breakup of that in MLW. There is nothing like the scale that he's had right now in AEW. It's unfortunate there's a falling out. Because I still feel like MJF needs AEW as much as AEW needs MJF. So, yeah, Tony needs Max. Max needs Tony. And I don't know if Vince is going to feel the same way or if he's going to get treated the same way. Maybe initially off the top. But will he get to sustain that will be the other question. Because he's not a big guy. But he could be that exception to the rule for everything that that could be going on with him going forward. But what's most important of what happened tonight, what is significant about everything else, I can forget about everything else that happened tonight. The only thing that mattered to me tonight 
when I was watching all the back and forth, all this pre-show stuff going on, and everybody making stories about it, meanwhile, I wasn't doing it. I didn't fall into it. I kept believing in my heart of hearts. Number one, he was going to show up at double or nothing. And the match was going to happen. And number two, I didn't think he was going to go ahead and... I still kind of feel like there's still a chance that whatever this might be is a work. Because there's nothing out there that tells me otherwise. I'm not sure what to think anyway. But what I will say about all this is, in terms of MGF's career, whether he stays in AEW and things get worked out, or he leaves in 2024 or finds a way to get out of this contract early to go, he might get bought out of this contract, for all we know. I mean, we don't know what could happen. But MJF could then go to WWE. would be the, the only other option he could go to if he's going to stay in wrestling. He would. His only other option would be to go up to WWE and expect for the best. But the one thing he needed to make sure of for his wrestling career in general was to not was for his own good, for his own personal reasons, he needed to get through the match with Wardlow tonight. That needed to happen. Now, I don't know if there was anything to do with where how he was being booked for this match and what he had to do, but we all know that for Wardlow's sake to become that star, he needed the payoff tonight. And they delivered the payoff. Ten, the, the, we got the Powerbomb Symphony, no Sean Spears to speak of. It was just MGF and Wardlow together. Wardlow gets 10 power bombs to MGF, finishes him off, gets the pin. Wardlow wins. And Tony Khan, then and there, offers a contract for him to be all elite. And Wardlow now is arguably one of the biggest faces in the company. Might be the biggest face in the company in general. This guy now, there's nothing. He is so over now. It's it's crazy. It's as if, you know, when Cody first came into the place, into AEW, and the level of face he was before he started getting turned on, Wardlow is a bigger face than Cody was right now. Wardlow is white hot. He hasn't had to say much. He's been out there. With security, he's got the Goldberg feel of a face push right now. Wardlow gets to go after a title at some point. Could he go somewhere go after the TNT title or the world title? We don't know. But I don't see how they don't look at that potential down the line where Wardlow goes next. But that story is done. They have completed the storyline with Wardlow and CM Punk. Stretched out the CM Punk storyline as the the, the MJF storyline as they always do. Every MJF storyline has to have the pillars, always has to have the tests, all these different obstacles in place. So they've done that. Now, the one thing I can tell you is that this method of MJF as the heel, he's had it on and going for three years. I will say this too, and people are not gonna might not agree with me on this. But maybe there's something about MGF where it's a bit of a pattern that's being done right now with MGF. And he wants to make sure that he's not falling on the same pattern where he's just the, the heel that always falls down and, you know, to get his heat back. And that's the thing that comes down there. Plus, it's the same thing that happens to him. He'll put as many obstacles in his way, chicken shit heel, always loses. And he's done that for, what, four major opponents so far not with Darby on if I'm correct I don't think that happened there but you have to say when it comes to to MDF Cody Rhodes Chris Jericho CM Punk and now Wardlow those are four of the major feuds he's had so far with the Wardlow feud culminating after CM Punk and the whole thing that happened to that what could very well happen now is that with MJF now being stretched out, writing him out of storyline for a significant amount of time, you could have him very well much coming back to go after CM Punk after everything that happened because CM Punk is the culprit. He is the reason this all fell apart. 
Like the entire pinnacle fell apart because of what CM Punk did. And now CM Punk's champion. And MGF could very well have CM Punk just go on as champion, have his reign, only for MGF to be the one to dethrone him after a, a, after a time away. And I would think that what you do with the MGF character is you evolve him. There's not so much of the chickishy heel anymore because now he doesn't have his entourage and he no longer has his bodyguard. So what do you do with MGF next? And I believe there's something about that part of the storyline that's the most intriguing to me in the entire night of Double or Nothing. He did the right thing by doing the match, being the professional, coming out there, getting the job done. If he's going to go, he's going to leave, whatever. But he did the professional thing tonight. He did the match. He took the job. It wasn't the thing he wanted to do, probably. But you know what? For the good of the business, he did the right thing. And that's going to look good. At least maybe if AEW is able to reconcile with him. But it's going to look excellent for him if he jumps to WWE. Period. This was the right move for him to go tonight. But I think there would be a staleness in the MJF character if we go to another feud and the same pattern happens. It's time for him to have something change here where it's now he doesn't have to be because we love the promos, but the outcomes for him can't be the same over and over. What needs to happen the next time around is MGF just can't be the heel that becomes the loser every time. That doesn't work for him. He has to have a win. He's gotten some wins and matches. Sure, but he's got to have something where he comes out on top. The Dynamite Diamond was the one thing he had several times. And once they get back to that Dynamite Diamond match, that that Battle Royal again, we at least have to see him come back for that. Because they make a point to bring that match back every year. And this is where MJF always comes in because he's the holder of the ring. We have to come back to that at some point. But that's a token of his success that he's been able to make in his run in AEW. But he has not gone for a world title yet. He has not gone for any titles of yet. He doesn't have to be the Roddy Piper, but I think MGF wants to be in the title picture somewhere. It's obvious. He wants to be world champion, and he should be. And he should have an amazing run as a world champion. Like, I would want that for him. I think of that character, I think I would love nothing more than to see... MJF find his way to run through and do that. Do we still see him doing payoffs? Do we still see him doing obstacles? I don't know if that continues, if that becomes a part. I mean, you can still continue to be creative on what those things are going to be, but what do you do after that is the question. I want to see what they do with Dynamite after the fact so we can continue on this conversation because I can go on with MJF for a while now, but I want to hold that back because it was the right time to talk about this now. And not speculate like everybody else did for the last, what, 72, 96 hours? Like ever since I left this show on Wednesday night, there was so much speculation going on on my MGF. I didn't want to get into it. Because I wasn't sure what to believe. No one could give some actual accurate information except for the flight. The backstage stuff is, I mean, people are being told things. But if there were certain things that were being told and verified, the thought process kept being by some people that he wasn't going to show. But they kept promoting him being on the show. They kept promoting it into the buy-in. And he was there. First thing out the curtain. You heard his music. And for MGF's sake, The one thing he did very much so, which is very humbling of other wrestlers that won't do this, and which is something that also like other organizations would normally want want to do this anyway, because there are people that don't want to be the enhancement talent, especially someone that young, but at 25 years old, I think he is, for him to start having to go and put other people over to become successful. It's for the good of the business, 
But most wrestlers would think, well, that's at the tail end of my career, not in my prime, which is where MJF is right now. But for the good of his business, he wants to make sure. I mean, his prime is still right now, and his prime is going to continue. It could go on for his, for a long time. He could go on for another 10, 15 years if he wants it to. And imagine where he could be by then. But it's things like this that I respect the man for at least doing that, no matter what kind of grievances he has right now, if they're true or not. I appreciate MJF for going through with the match and for Wardlow to get this match done. So in the match itself, and by the way, the buy-in, they had Hookhausen versus Tony Nese and Smart Mark Sterling. I was surprised to see Tony Nese is ranked number five, and he's 16-2. And, and a lot of those matches on Dark and Dark Elevation with a couple of matches on Rampage. But Tony Nese quietly getting a spot. And this is the, see how effective the quietly being pushed rank can be, being ranked push can be. Because this is a quiet push. It's not being pushed in front of Dynamite and Rampage so extensively. Like, you know about Tony Nese. You've seen him on TV. But he's racked up wins. And this is that part of disconnect with the audience where, well, if it's not on Dynamite and Rampage, I mean, why am I going to care? They make it an important enough point that you should watch Dark and Dark Television, which sometimes it's tough for me to keep up with, but I still watch it anyway. Well, anyway, Hook is controlling the match for the most part, and it's only up until the end where start, Smart Mark Sterling is stuck there, flat on the mat. Hook's going to take the pin, but then he tags in Dan Housen to get, to get the pin himself when Sterling was already basically unconscious. As we said with MJF and Wardlow to start the night, he left the match. He never left. He made the match. Ten power bombs to MJF. Full recompense. Full retribution for Wardlow. Freed the best night of his life. The best night of his wrestling career to date. Everything is set now for Wardlow to be the next Goldberg. But this time you don't screw him up. Because I don't know who you have that will take that first loss to Wardlow if whenever that comes down the line but that doesn't need to be right now what Wardlow needs to continue to do on is the Goldberg streak and let me tell you this too make it longer than the Goldberg streak just out of spite of Goldberg past 176 and 0 do that for me get us all the way there that's what I want I want the Goldberg streak to be broken by Wardlow that will be a wonderful thing for a long-time wrestling fan to me, if that's even possible. But that's what they should do anyway, is get him on the run, let him be the Goldberg run, run through various wrestlers he can uh, before you start putting some real tough opponents on him. But there's a number of stars you can put him on against. You can continue to put him over on dark and dark elevation, as you always do. But let me warn also, you need to keep him more on Dynamite. And Rampage. Like, he needs to be consistently on those shows now. Like, his matches should be almost solely on those two shows with a rare dark or dark elevation appearance. Because he's a star now. He's a top baby face in this company. No doubt about it. How can you not like the guy? The Hardys versus Young Bucks. You know, I really like this match. And, yeah, they did. Didn't they wrestle each other before? I'm pretty sure they have. But here in the match, Matt and Jeff Hardy against Young Bucks. The Bucks played the Vegas deal. Super kick party. I like that switch of Viva Las Vegas. That was good. The jumpsuits was a nice touch. And this story played up the storyline of Jeff being constantly being injured, having the uh, upper ribs and uh, you know his body being all broken up, and the injury hurting him where Matt had to take care of a good brunt of the action during the match until Jeff recovered. And you see some of the things they do. Some of the things they do. Jeff, another shot where he does the swan tom bomb off the uh, stairs. They do that again. And these guys can still go. The Hardys are motivated. And when they did that go-home promo I heard the other night that this is their last run. Like specifically, Matt said that. You know, they made the comeback, they get the win, and 
this is where they're trying to make their best run to finish up together. And maybe this is the time where they're going to just do one more run here together as the Hardys, run it like they did back in the, you know, just back 20 something years ago and say, okay, let's do it one more time together with the fans and then we'll hang it up. I don't know. Maybe that's what they're going to do. But I like what they did with the match. Hell of a night. Hell of a match with them. And I give them a lot of time, by the way, too. TBS Championship, Jay Cargill and Anna Jay. And Anna Jay, she was a little bit iffy on a couple of spots. There was the sunset flip off the top rope that was botched. And it was another thing that looked kind of botched when she went off the top rope. It was not her best night. We like Anna Jay, but... If you're going to put her in there with Jade Cargill, I mean, Jade Cargill, we're already a little bit skeptical because she's still kind of green, and it's got to be the right opponent that she has that'll work well with her to work on this whole part, but this is the secondary title. So there are certain stars not going to be part of it. We know there were a bunch of stars that were part of the Owen Hart tournament, and in this here, a lot of of interference. I mean, Anna J stay, stays looking strong throughout this because there's so many different things that Jay Cargill has at her arsenal, which is also window dressing for the fact that Jay Cargill cannot go a long match. She's just not there yet. So yeah, the company's gotten smart by putting a whole lot of inf- interference uh, buffers the same way that Britt Baker had during her title run, but this is much more. The baddies. It's kind of the same idea where Jamie Hayter and Reba come into the play for Britt Baker. But then you have the management with Mark Sterling, which now looks like he's out. He's fallen in favor because of what happened during the match. And then what happens later in the night? So let's just go into what it was real quickly. You go down the line where Batty's interference starts to help a lot with a Jade character. And that started becoming, uh, you know, out when they went out to the floor and a Jay was dealing with them. Then Mark Sterling coming up to the ropes to try to interfere in what was going on to keep Jade to hold on to the belt. After Anna got a near fall off of Jade, and at least to level the playing field, you did get John Silver out there to attack Mark Sterling. There were no women on the Dark Order besides Anna Jay to help out in this case. So at least John Silver coming out gave a little bit of leverage, a little bit of evening the paving field for Anna Jay to get back in the match. But then the final distraction here is Stokely Hathaway, who comes out and actually accompanies Jade Cargill after Jade gets the win. Yeah, we got that part. So it looks like Stokely Hathaway has made it into AEW and now will be probably the new manager while Sterling is still probably the lawyer or the advocate, I guess, now you have a management in Stokely Hathaway. That's a good that's a good spot, but I don't want Stokely Hathaway, unfortunately. Stokely Hathaway doesn't necessarily have to say too much. Jay Cargill's a pretty good promo so far. So you find the best way to put those two together and to kind of make sure that they don't undershadow one of the others. Like they, they both have to have their time because Stokely Hathaway is a hell of a talker, and so is Jade, to her credit. And then he also followed up with the potential now of a trios match that we look like definitely is going to happen somewhere down the line, where Statlander confronts Ved Velvet, and then a third member to help out Anna Jay and Chris Statlander, the fallen goddess Athena who's come out here and now she's embedded into this tri- this trios thing however they want to play that which is a nice touch a whole lot of new pieces into the puzzle and really it's just because the whole thing with this trio right now was just something here because Jay Cargill did not have an opponent and they just decided let's go ahead and put Anna Jay here because she's got the ranking let's put her in this match nobody expected her to gonna lose Jay Cargill 32-0 and she continues to hold on to that belt pretty strongly and there is nobody I see right now that we need to go and have that needs to go and take that belt off of Jay Cargill right now. She's in the middle of a nice long run. Good to see her holding on to it again. Trio match. You got House of Black versus Death Triangle. The crowd is hot here. They might have teed off a little bit for the TBS title. I think they might have slowed down a little bit. But they did really pick it back up because the trio's match was fantastic. 
House of Black coming out of war paint. Very aggressive. Pretty aggressive and fast-paced, the match, most of all. These guys work really stiff with each other. And, I mean, it's just good to finally see everybody in injury-free and healthy to do this match together. And it got time. But this is just the start of the feud. There's much more to go to this because they added a nice touch. Now, we know that a few weeks ago, we all got a little bit miffed about how Julia Hart did not make the full turn with House of Black, even though she was kind of tempted to do something to attack Griff Garrison with a chair, but chose not to. And Malachi Black and the House of Black started to intimidate her. But then Julia Hart goes off and goes away. Now, when we saw the Varsity Blondes in action, I want to say it was in dark. She did not come out with them. Like, ever since that incident, Julia Hart has not been anywhere to be seen. She's not wrestled, nothing. But then tonight, she comes out, gives the black mist to Pac, to Pac, excuse me, and Malachi is able to get the win. And Julia Hart now, all dressed in black, now with the patch off, and now she has that dark, you know, the growing uh, black sense in her eye now she is totally fully turned heel which is the movie all expected to happen they just decided to be a little bit hesitant before they did so that might have gotten people kind of like what the hell but julia hart turning heel was the right move that's where we are yep she's no longer that lovable cheerleader she is now turned full to the dark side with house of black it's a nice touch here makes sense but now what do we do with julia hart and how does she get incorporated in the House of Black? Where does it go with, here, with us from here? I mean, there's a lot of things you could do with a storyline here. And when it comes to the House of Black and Death Triangle, storyline continues. This just furthers the feud because of how the ending came out. So it, it works for me. I like it all together. Next, we got the two matches for the men's and women's tournament for the Owen Hart Foundation Tournament. So look. Well, I'm not going to get too much into the matches themselves. We had vo both really good matches tonight. Just two good quality, straight-up matches here with Adam Cole and Samoa Joe. Even though Bobby Bobby Fish did help Cole get the win over Samoa Joe, so there is that interference. And, of course, Samoa Joe has other things to deal with right now with Satnam Singh, which that not getting, we didn't necessarily get any of that right there into this. But we know that... Samoa Joe is going to have issues with the Undisputed Elite. That's going to be something to continue going forward. Plus, then his issues with Satnam Singh, Jay Lethal, and Sanjay Dutt. So, Samoa Joe's in a whole lot of stuff right now. In the women's tournament, Britt Baker's Ruby Soho coming out to live music interest was a fantastic touch. A good homage with Ruby Soho. We was able to reverse out of the lockjaw to get the sharpshooter locked in. But meanwhile, Britt was able to go and win with just a simple roll-up to win the match, just like that. They all did really well in this match, got some good time. The, the power couple of Adam Cole and Britt Baker collectively win the Owen Hart Trophy and their own custom belts. The tournament was on both sides was treated very well, giving us what? five six weeks of this whole tournament just to get ourselves from the qualifiers into the matches themselves they they took so much time to do it it gave so much quality time and such an important thing for all these wrestlers to get be a part of because everybody that was in, embedded into this tournament was important into the brackets themselves every match felt like it mattered Every match had that level of importance and, and distinction and prestige. I mean, AEW and Tony Khan really did go all out to make the Owen Hart thing really important and special for Martha Hart because Martha Hart looked like she was shining like a million bucks out there because of how well AEW treated this tournament in tribute for Owen. And this was a really great tournament. I love it. Really good stuff. And the one thing... That, unlike other tournaments, you know, when you look at the May Young Classic, you look at, you know, say Crockett Cup. I mean, just think about tournaments that are out there. King of the Ring. 
about how you see these kind of tournaments come up, and you always hope that there's certain stars that will rise from out of this. But for what's, what it's worth, with Britt Baker dropping the Women's World title to Thunder Rosa, and for her to go and get this victory here in the tournament and to go all the way through was very significant for Britt Baker to get her heat back. And for Adam Cole, he hasn't had a... I mean, he did get a chance to go after the world title. But here, he gets this here as something significant for him to go ahead and put his notch on as something prestigious that so he got the win as well. So this was good for them all together. I like the way the tournament was done. And I feel like there's going to be some storyline somewhere about the fact that they're both winners of the Owen. It's more than I would get from other wrestling tournaments for the most part, except for the uh, the best of the Super Juniors, things like that. We know. The the one match I didn't make much uh, point of, which I felt like, I mean, I get why they put it in the in the card, but I kind of felt like, well, I'll actually get that in a minute. Mixed Trios match. Uh, Scorpio Sky, Ethan Page, Page Van Zant, Frank Gazarian, Ethan Page, Ty Conti. Well... Kazarian Kazarian, Sammy Guevara you could tell there was a lot of issues between them where things were that was the falling out that really got things to where they are and that would be a concern and that's where Sammy and Frankie obviously are going to have their thing right there because it was not just Frankie dealing with Sammy it's also with Ty and that whole breakup they were just the team got kind of put together and they had their issues. And Frankie Kazarian actually looked really strong in the whole match. I like where he was going with all that. And Sammy Guevara hitting his his girlfriend and the look. I'm still not getting into much of the, into Sammy Guevara doing this. But again, he is the heel and that's exactly where he's supposed to be in the match. So that makes sense to me. America top team wins and Paige Van Zandt gets a, a win on her belt. It does pretty good for the match of the night. In, in the night for that match. I'm not going to say match of the night because it's not. It was a very good match, though. Kyle Raleigh and Darby Allen. Even this match got some time. I was surprised by that. It got nine minutes. And they wanted to get this story in line in with Red Dragon and Sting and being, Sting being taken out by this Undisputed Elite and Darby Allen you know, trying to avenge his fallen compadre. But Kyle Raleigh gets the win in the match, nevertheless. And Darby Allen takes another takes a loss. And Darby also got the first blood of the night because he was got like some internal bleeding, so he's coughing up blood in the match itself. But Kyle Raleigh, they're making definitely a point to keep him very strong on the night as well. And Undisputed Elite had a pretty good night overall, it looks like. They'll obviously make that a point in storyline going forward. Where there's various things you got. Because Samoa Joe's got a, a bone to pick. So does Sting when he comes back. And so does Darby Allen. So there's a lot there you can go off of with that storyline. There's a lot left to go. And when you're looking at things right now, we're moving along the storylines. Only a little bit do we have some storylines that kind of had some closure for the most part. Because we know House of Black and, and Death Triangle, that storyline will continue. We know Jake Cargill and now this new thing with the baddies along with Statlander, Athena, and Anna J. That's going to continue. And I don't know where the Hardys and the, uh, uh, the Bucks will be in their thing down the line, but we'll see where they're going to go with that. AEW Women's World Title, Thunder Rosa and Serena Deeb. Everybody was saying, well, this could be like a boring match because for AEW fans, you know, them and Meg on the women, they don't they weren't sure how when people looked at this storyline how it was put together. Where Serena Deeb's comments were more or less about trying to, you know, avenge where she was treated badly in other places and she's trying to make something for herself here legitimacy and some seriousness to who she is and how great a wrestler she really is besides everything else that was done done to make her superficially more important than the eyes of WWE anyway. I 
And Thunder Rosa, you know, has been very much about heritage, about her people, and just of where she's gone to get to where she is right now with the belt. These two had a clinic. And I remember seeing Thunder Rosa in matches for, what was it, uh, the primetime tapings for NWA when they were going during COVID. And just seeing, and I still remember pretty well Thunder Rosa going against against who we all know as Gigi Dolan now. <clears throat> but of course, we know her actually as Priscilla Kelly uh, working in the Indies. And I just still remember there was a match where Thunder Rosa and Priscilla Kelly took on each other. And I had at a barn burner of a match with no crowd. And they were just tearing it up. They were really the grunting, hard-hitting, brutal at each other. Having a great, looking like a 20-minute match. Just, just tearing it up. And it was because of that match I just really had this thing where Thunder Rosa just continues to have this momentum. And really, her work in NWA was fantastic. Her working with Allison K and all the things that were going on with that and with Marty Bell. I remember all that going on. And Melina, that was such good stuff at the early days of the early power tapings. And that's what got Thunder Rosa over so hype. So to credit has to go to Billy Corgan. And then, of course, Billy Corgan allowing Thunder Rosa to go and work in AEW and Tony Khan eventually be able to go and sign her to a contract because Thunder Rosa was going to be a bigger star. She has reached her full potential right now as the women's world champion. This match here with Serena D. Serena D. we've been looking at. I really enjoyed the work she did with her Karashita throughout the last year and a half or so. Like, I've loved that feud together. And that might still not be done yet. But for what it's worth, Serena D. When I saw her working the NWA uh, Women's World Title and working the matches there, hell of a job working matches over there. And she was great, too. But that's the thing you got to say as well. These are two former. Am I right? Did Thunder Rosa win the NWA World's Title? Did she win that title over there? I forget if she did. No, that's right. She did win win the Women's World Title. She did win the Burke. I forgot about that. That's right, A Hard Times, 2020, which was a show I didn't, I don't think I got a chance to watch. Oh, no, no, I think I did. No, I'm sorry. I think I did, did see that, January 2020. So, yeah, Thunder Rosa and Serena Deep, former NWA World Women's World Champions, an epitome of what Billy Corgan was doing in that organization. So for those two to go ahead and come out here and put a match together, didn't matter how many people you had. That was the other thing, too. Because Thunder Rosa and Serena Deep have worked on their smaller crowds anyway. They could have been working on the NWA arena with like under under a couple hundred people. You put them out there in front of 15,000, people kind of worried, like, are they going to keep that crowd inspired and, and interested? Well, they did. And people were all in it for Thunder Rosa. They were totally cheering her. And Serena Deep was the pure heel here. The hell of a match. 17 minutes they got. Thunder Rosa gets the win. You can let these two wrestle all they want. Just a solid match. Just really good stuff. Submissions all over the place. This was good. It lived up to the hype. Even though they might have felt like the hype wasn't that intense, like some of the other feuds, this match did what it needed to do. And not every feud needs to be with like promos that are going to be like so... Like the, the promos were solid to me. The build, they didn't go over crazy on it. And they just haven't done that much with some of the women's feuds i mean when it comes to brett baker being in a feud or when it comes to jake cargo being in a feud that's one thing but thunder rosa not necessarily except for when it was against brett baker but then she got the win over brett baker which is great and thunder rosa had a very solid opponent and i guess somebody that was as we said they definitely tore it up over an nwa And for those of you that might have missed that, you probably never realized these two would tear it up tonight. So I had no doubt this was going to be a good match. That's why. This was a clinic. It's old school feel to it. Submission and brutal. Being down back and forth. Great match. Really a great match for these two. Loved it. So Jericho Appreciation Society versus Blackpool Combat Club. Eddie Kingston, Santana Ortiz. 
you have to go ahead and look back at the three-minute promo, which they did show within Double or Nothing, or actually the buy-in they did that. I would recommend going to go watch that Eddie Kingston promo where he's taking a couple shots and the, what he says he's going to do to Jericho. I mean, Eddie Kingston has done some promos, but this was epic. The way he just fell apart and was just crying and just total emotion in the promo itself about what he's going to do to Jericho. And in the match, you can just tell he, he was delivering exactly the kind of emotion that he put in that promo. Eddie Kingston has been just remarkable on AEW. I didn't know he had all this in him, but he has been so exceptional right now. Another babyface, by the way. Another top babyface right there along with Wardlow is Eddie Kingston. Lovable. You just can't help but respect the man and, and the far that they'll go with everything. And then, in this match, I'm going to just say it like this. I'm old school enough to remember when New Jack used to always run in ECW. With John Moxley, they're throwing Wild Thing on. They continue to loop the song as John Moxley's doing his thing. And I'm saying to myself, this is just New Jack and ECW, which this crowd hasn't seen in over 20 years, or maybe some of them never saw this. They might have just heard about it. They might have seen the rise of all the ECW or whatever, and they want to think, oh, yeah, this thing, New Jack and Mustafa, and the matches they would have. That's exactly a bit of what this was, because this wasn't going to be a straight-up match. We already know that Moxley or Danielson can definitely do straight-up matches. So could Jericho, of course. And so could Daniel Garcia or, you know, 2.0 or whatever. But this was just plunder. We're just going to go all across. So I felt like the Stadium Stampede match, which he referenced in the match here, kind of felt like we got that mixed in with the match that Omega and Moxley had together where Moxley, you know, he uh, sends... Omega threw a table through a glass table. Remember that that match where they just spilled all over the arena. This was also the same thing. Some pretty crazy moves. Ladders used, tables used. Moxley undoes the top rope in the ring and uses that to attack Jericho. But I'll tell you, Kingston was the one that really put out something, man. Like this. They look like he was Snake Plissken from Escape from New York. I put this in my notes. I really feel like he just went through a war. Blood and just gutted out and ripped up and torn apart. The guy looked like a mess after this match. There's a point where Danielson is choking with a belt. And you can just think Justin Roberts and him being fired for the Nexus and all that. Of course, that's why they did that 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 spot but then they go into the match where there's a breakdown between the Blackpool Combat Club and Kingston because Kingston comes out with a can of gasoline to go ahead and toss it on Jericho to light him on fire which he said he was going to do and Daniel said has to hold him back and then there's a falling out with those guys from that which would lead to the ending of the match Danielson taking the busted rope and then a single leg crab by Jericho for the win. So Jericho Appreciation Society wins Anarchy in the Arena after all that's happened there. Crazy match to go through on the night. Then they show Andrade talking about the AFO being losers. Things to not find a new partner. And he brings in El Toro Blanco. Roosh! The former Ring of Honor World Champion into the fold. And Roosh is now probably going to work Ring of Honor, but also will work AEW, or however they're going to do it. Which, by the way, there was a media call that Ring of Honor, or that uh, Tony Khan had, where he was asked about Ring of Honor and said he had some good discussions with Warner Brothers Discovery, and that maybe down the line, Ring of Honor will get its own TV show and continue to do pay-per-views. I'd love to see all that. Because Ring of Honor has still been kept in some way, shape, or form on Dynamite and Rampage, which is nice. But do we get to... I mean, what's the next thing the normal would do? 
Because in this time of year, I forget, Best in the World would be the next show they would be doing. And that would have to be in July, right? No, or in August, I guess. I'm trying to think. Ring of Honor would normally do their thing. And... Or is it the anniversary show? I forget. Well, the anniversary show would have already happened, but they did Super Card of Honor. Anniversary show was missed to get to this here. And so normally in the run of things, Best of the World runs in July. So that will be the next pay-per-view if Ring of Honor is going to be running again that Tony Khan's going to run. Will that happen? I don't know. But that will be the next thing we're going to see next. And then... We don't know about the other shows are ever going to be done, but like I don't imagine that if they're going to do quarterly shows right now, they won't do Glory by Honor. But I imagine they'll do. They'd have to do probably that, and probably Final Battle, at the end of the year. Like I would hope Ring of Honor will the, the Ring of Honor brand will get two more pay per views this year. In that, that would be nice to go and see. I don't know if that'll be the case, but I'd like to see that. Uh, Jurassic Express retains over Keith Lee and Storr Strickland over Team Taz as well. First of all, because Keith Lee, Storr Strickland, and then the Team Taz feud must continue, but it won't necessarily need a belt. And doesn't look like there's much to have the tag team titles lost yet. Even though Christian's still out there making sure to kind of police things going on, going on, on the outside. That helps out Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus, but I'm still waiting. We know down the line there will be a heel turn by Christian. He will betray those two somewhere, and that will cost the tag team title somewhere down the line. But we can't have that happen yet. There's just too many other things going on within the pay-per-view, too many other storylines to continue to work on for that to be a part of that, so they didn't bother with that. Now, as for the World Heavyweight title, Hangman Page versus CM Punk. They got 22 minutes for this match. They told a whole lot. In the match, we know that that main storyline, which was focused in this match itself, was that Hangman Adam Page was getting very much upset and was just kind of losing, was getting overly aggressive and angry and upset with CM Punk, as we know. And Hangman continued to kind of taunt and troll at CM Punk using his moves and doing everything that he did in matches. And their confrontations were got much more heated and much more intense. And CM Punk just kind of tried to play it cool. And they told a very good story in the match where Paige really didn't need to go and stoop to any particular level for CM Punk. I mean, Paige is the world was the world champion, and he was strong, and he took on all comers and had a hell of a run. But with where everything was, you saw that Paige really put out quite a bit of, of a match here tonight. And it's amazing that they went with what they decided to do with the matches here. 197 day run as champion for Hangman Adam Page, who won it at full gear, and done what happens next now with cm punk cm punk now wins the belt and after all this time we kind of figured cm punk was going to be the the title holder somewhere down the line because it's good for him to be the title holder for someone that's going to be the next bit with another big star one of the young pillars to be the one that will take the belt off of cm punk CM Punk becomes the fifth world champion in the company. And also keep in mind, they really have not had a lot of people that have been very young holding that belt anyway. Let's put that point across as well. Because Adam Page is 30 years old. And everyone that has held the belt has been over 30 years old. Everyone's held it. Has been an older wrestler. So for CM Punk to hold this belt now at his age, it'd be nice to see a young up-and-coming star, one of the young pillars, be the next one groomed to finally be that person that will take the belt off of CM Punk. Because I don't want to see it where it's a Brian Daniels or a John Moxley or 
someone else like that. I'd like to see it be a young star that's going to be the one that will take the belt off of him. As we said, if there is a young up-and-coming star and everything can work out right, let's go full circle here. MJS should be the one that will be able to go ahead and go after that belt. And CM Punk is goaded into doing that and giving MJF the title shot somewhere, somehow. And MJF wins it. That's a, a great story there. And there are other stars that we have in the company that can very well watch be in that same place. But CM Punk now having to go and defend that belt. He's now a heel as a champion. Where do we go with that? And that's what I want to find out as well. Because now CM Punk is the second heel to be the champion in this company. That's what I want to go and find out what they're going to decide to do. So I like all that so far. And we don't know where Kenny Omega is yet. If he comes back down the line, we know that it's been a while for him where he's been in the picture and he had the belt and did his thing. But we have not seen Kenny Omega since full gear. And it could be time for him to come back at some point. Maybe not yet. But there's a lot of questions to be asked. And there's a lot of things that still continue to go ongoing on Dynamite this week, which will be fascinating. And you know what? AEW makes it so easy for me to go and talk about this for an hour, and I did pretty much. Fascinating. Great pay-per-view tonight. Double or nothing. There's a whole lot more to be talked about this. But we're going to leave it like this tonight. Thanks for listening to the Wrestling Culture Podcast. Where you find the show, subscribe to it. Please do. And also go to my main website, kingofpodcasts.com, and check out the radio network where there's so much more you can find out about what I'm doing with my other programming. And so we'll talk Wednesday night going into Thursday. The regular episode comes in. Hope you enjoyed the post show. Come back for another Wrestling Goes Real podcast because wrestling needs us. Thank you for listening to the Wrestling Is Real podcast. You can find all previous episodes at WrestlingIsReal.com or subscribe to the show on all major podcast outlets, including Apple, Amazon, Google, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Follow the King of Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at King of Podcasts. And search King of Podcasts on YouTube or type youtube.com slash jbrasco951. This has been a presentation of the King of Podcasts Radio Network.